aspirational hero. 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 Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Aspirational. So the aspirational heroes need to be there. They need to be pure, 100% from the beginning. They need to be at that unattainable goal of perfection and good and hopeful and inspirational and all of that. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that ass. Hello everyone, I am Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel. Love that video. Can't get enough of it. It's just so great. Uh, welcome to another Office Hours live stream. You guys can let me know in the chat how the audio is. I... Oop, what did I just do? What in the world just happened to my computer screen? That was weird. Everything just kind of refreshed or... Did something weird, but yeah, let me know if I uh, if I'm clipping or coming in a little too hot. I thought I was um, I thought it looked a little low when I came in first. So, but I got that fixed and everything. So, looks like the camera's a little high up. There we go. So, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you had a great week. Ready for uh, ready for my weekend. I know. Also, blessed uh, Palm Sunday to those of you who observe. It was a great, uh, Sonny Graver and I just went to a wonderful vigil mass service. I read, I'm, I serve as a lector at my parish, so uh, I, I'm, I'm usually the narrator for uh, for Palm Sunday, and that's a lot of reading, but came home and got the most amazing nap. Just feel so energized, and plus we're talking about archetypes today, and I I could talk about archetypes in my sleep, so uh, we're, we're good. We're going to have a good good stream. Uh, welcome to you guys. Uh, Ghost Planet Max Inc. I think was first. Darth Enigma, Private Eye, Eldritch Fan. Andre Hernandez is asking, do you plan on seeing Ghostbusters Frozen Empire? Uh, I do plan on seeing that. To be honest, I had forgotten that it was even out. I guess it opened this weekend, didn't it? No clue when I'll go see it. I'm not like rushing to it to go do a review. Gotta get the clicks, you know, or anything like that. Um, yeah, I'm not expecting much. I'm hoping for a good, fun sequel to the to the alternate timeline that is afterlife but uh but like i said for the, for those movies i'm not you know I, I know a lot of people didn't like afterlife and i get it i get why you wouldn't uh i enjoyed it enough as an alternate timeline so yeah i'll go see frozen empire i'll let you know what i think when i do get around to seeing it i did see the trailer for the beetlejuice too and you know i'm a that's that's like that's golden age tim burton for me you know uh edward scissorhands Beetlejuice, Batman, you know, the oh, it's just I grew up on that stuff, freaking loved it. And uh so I was pretty excited about the idea of a um of a uh Beetlejuice 2, even though in, in some ways it's like way too late. Come on, you know, you should have had a sequel in the freaking 90s. This is ridiculous that we had to wait till 2024 for a sequel to Beetlejuice. It's unacceptable. Um at the same time, I I the trailer looked cool, you know, whatever. I uh, I'm so out of the touch. I'm so out of touch. I, I saw the returning cast and I was like, "Where's Jeffrey Jones? Come on, why isn't he back there?" And then someone, our fan man and uh, Big Albert, telling me he's like, you know, he, he got uh, accused or not accused. He was convicted of. Um, I don't think he actually had contact with a minor, but he was like getting this young boy to like pose suggestively for him. Or something. I was like, "Oh man, that oh stop it, stop it, Hollywood, stop being gross and weird and and and." disgusting and, and all this kind of stuff. Jeffrey Jones was in so many great films. I uh, loved his work in Transylvania 65,000, Beetlejuice, of course, uh, Ferris Bueller. He was, yeah, he was the principal of Ferris Bueller. So many great things, but uh, alas. But so totally, I think he's probably the one, it's probably his funeral that they're going to in the trailer. Um, but it'll be interesting because even in the Beetlejuice makeup, Michael Keaton looks a lot older. 
Uh, so I don't know if there's a story reason for why Beetlejuice, the ghost, would have aged like that or looked decrepit. Who knows? But uh, it, it was fun to watch. The trailer was fun to watch. Do I do I expect anything out of it? Not really, especially with Tim Burton's recent track record. But you know, maybe we'll see. It's weird that they that they're just. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been talking about, you know, for a while we've been talking about how they just keep bringing back these these old movies. And for a while it was, okay, They um, Hollywood, that's a sure bet for them, right? You know, even though it's ridiculous, it shouldn't be a sure bet because you keep ruining all these old franchises and they're not you're not bringing back the built-in audiences necessarily. Now I truly do think, though, that they just don't have any ideas. I think they've, for so long, they've privileged writers who will come in and give them uh, agendas and, and and tack that on to to older franchises or whatever that now it's to the point where the writers that they've hired in Hollywood for the most part they it's like what's a new idea what do we I mean oh, write something ourselves what do we how do you do that you know I think they just they the system is just so um so so corrupt so dead by now who knows uh Elders fan says, please don't talk about the Acolyte. I'm so sick of everyone going on and on about the Acolyte. I haven't watched the trailer. Don't intend to. I am going to bring the full weight of my channel against the Acolyte. I'm going to fight the good fight against Disney. We're going to review every single episode. You guys stick with me. You click that subscribe, smash that like button, ring that bell. We're going to we're gonna do it. Oh, and don't forget my Patreon. We're going to fight again. No. Yeah. I didn't even know. Is Acolyte out yet? I, I, or was it just a trailer or something released? Who knows? Um, could not care less. The only reason I would talk about something like that is if uh, some distinct angle became uh, apparent to me that no one else was talking about, and it'd probably be something that you know has to do with my own background or something like that. That's the only reason I would say anything like that. Uh, Nathaniel's Lowe's Ball, welcome. Yeah, I, you know, archetypes is fun. I, this is my scholarship. This is what I teach. So. And, uh, and I'll talk to you. I'll, I'll get into it in a second why I thought it was good about time to have a refresher. Um, who else is with us? Leia Plus Size. Great to see you. Tom Spiel, Spiegel. Excuse me. Super Otaku. Studio Super. Great to see you. Nerd Wizard. Nice name. Final Fantasy Fan. Of course, my dear sound engraver is here with us. Uh, composing while she listens. Samuel Proctor, channel member. Great to see you. I got a super chat down here, too, somewhere. Oh, Michael's uh, Scambati. Uh, I push geek. If you could only recommend one Batman, Superman, Lex Luthor, and Joker story, what would yours be? I am partial to the business Lex and funny clown Joker, not edgelord Joker. I agree. I do agree. Um, in that vein, if you're looking for a story with all four of those characters in it, immediately what springs to mind is the great team-up from the animated series. You know, Batman and Superman, when they finally meet, and, and Lex and Joker play a part in that. That's a really great, really great one. I forget what the, uh, the team-up is called. You can look it up online. Look up uh, Batman the Animated Series meets Superman the Animated Series or whatever. It was the crossover. That was really great. But yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, I had done a um, a video, you know, to stop making Batman the Punisher. And I even put like a poll up on YouTube. And a lot of people had a great discussion there. You should Batman kill or it's edgy stuff. Because, of course, I, I ridiculous that you make Batman kill or keep pushing everything to be edgy, edgy, edgy. And a lot of people made the good point, which I'd agree with. You know, part of it is people keep making the Joker darker, darker, darker. You know, this, this, um, it predated the New 52. The New 52 even ramped it up more. Let's have the Joker, like, cut his own face off and like, stop it, stop it. Scott Snyder needs therapy. He, he's written some great things, but the, the dude just knows how to drive something into the ground. He picks like two or three ideas and then just like he puts them everywhere. Every, you get a mech suit. You get a mech suit. You get a mech suit. <laughs> you know, everybody's a dark psychopathic serial killer. I don't know. Um, let's see. More folks here. Dr. Y, Omega. Great to see everybody here. Stunning and brave. All right. Um, Another super chat here from Michael Scambati said, uh, so far I've come to Lex Luthor unauthorized biography and laughing fish is my favorite uh, for the Lex and Joker, but want to check out more. Oh, so you mean like necessarily individual stories as well? Yeah, I mean, um, there's so many great stories. I mean, if you find it, if, ideally, if you find a good Batman story, then you'll find the good Joker story. You know, if you find a good Superman story, you'll find a good Lex story. I do like business Lex. I like the Lex Luthor 
even though he's not bald, he's a little bit of the older uh, type of Lex Luthor, the one that was in Superman for all seasons. I like that aspect. You know, a Lex Luthor who's got plans for the city, who who wants that, um, you know, wants to be the city's savior of, of sorts, you know. I do like that kind of idea. So, uh, so yeah, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Good, uh, good, good topic to start things out with. Big Al presents popping by. Good to see you there. Uh, Studio Super, thank you, thank you. Said, what's the acolyte? I know, yeah, some stupid new way for Disney to drive Star Wars into the ground. One of these days, I mean, you know, I will say this about the um, the acolyte. Look at the channel. Pay attention to the channels now. If if it's if I'm correct in assuming that the trailer just dropped, I think that's all that's happened. Has the first season dropped? I don't think I don't think it's we're that far into it yet. I don't keep up with this nonsense. Um, but pay attention to the streams or to the channels that are rah, 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 rah about it right now. Um, it could go one of two ways. It could go the She-Hulk route, which is, oh my gosh, this is so horrible. Let's talk about it ad nauseum and yay, those clicks. You know, it can go that route. Or it can go the route of um, something more like Book of Boba Fett or whatever. Like, guys, you know, it's actually, you know, blah, 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 you know, or whatever. It's just, uh, come on, YouTubers, have some integrity. It's all we ask. Tis all we ask. Uh, we'll make sure I didn't miss any super chats there before we get going and get rolling. Okay, so yeah, archetypes. The reason why I decided that uh, we should start out, we should, it's about time to give a refresher on archetypes, is because I had a few videos recently. The um, you know, the one I mentioned already. You know, should Batman kill that one? Even when I was talking about, you know, like my thoughts on the Ripperverse and and uh, giving my reviews and stuff like that, or our thoughts on something like uh, the Alpha Corn and whatnot. You know, I throw a lot of terms around like the aspirational hero and stuff like that. And and a lot of people who don't really know the things I talk about on my channel a lot think that I'm think that I'm talking about something else, or they assume that you know, like for the time that I said that. Um, I couldn't find a really good aspirational hero of 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 moment, you know, of of um of weight at all in One Punch Man. And somebody's like, "What are you talking about? Saitama's hugely aspirational. All the dedication he has." And if you're just thinking about the meaning of the word aspirational, then yeah, it's like, well, you know, I aspire to be whatever this character's like. Therefore, they are aspirational. But that's not what I mean. You know, I'm talking about specific labels, specific archetypes. And I know that those of you who follow my channel forever uh, know a lot of these things. You're probably tired of me talking about them, or maybe not. Maybe that's why you keep coming back to the channel. But I thought it's about time for a bit of a refresher. So when, when I'm saying the word archetype, yes, you know, we can, we can trace that back ultimately to Jung. And then, you know, Freud by way of Jung, really, you know. Um, but it really goes back to Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, you know, the hero itself is an archetype. Now, the field of study that I'm looking at here, and that I, it's, it's a very few people actually study this, I'm one of the few people, but the actual, uh, call them sub-archetypes if you want, okay, so you've got the archetype of the hero, and we can even specifically look at the archetype of the superhero if you want, great. Okay, now, how does that archetype break down? What kind of, of typical patterns do we see? What types of heroes, what types of superheroes do we see? You know, how can we start classifying these characters? And, and you might say, well, why do you need to know that? Why do you need to do that? Because if you better understand the type of character that you're trying to write, if you're a writer or create or whatever, uh, you know these rules, these things that tend to work well with that hero or the the, the the ways in which the audience expects and 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 comes to this hero for the, the the roles that they come to that hero for and whatnot, you'll be more effective as a storyteller. Also, if you're just a, a consumer of story, you know, a, a reader of you know film goer or whatever, you'll be able to better judge these stories and understand why this hero uh, appealed to you more than that one, and so forth. You know, those of you who are role play game uh, RPGers or whatever, you know, especially if you're game masters and whatever, you'll really, you'll really um, understand this a lot. You know, it, it struck me the other day. I've never been a a, a tabletop role playing gamer. <clears throat> you know, I, I like video games, role play games, but um, you know, RPG video games, but uh, never really been a tabletop RPG or Dungeons and Dragons or, or any of the the games like that. But I always loved the books, the source books. You know, whether it's Star Wars, Ghostbusters, DC. In fact, I grew up with a DC 
uh, Heroes DC Universe source book for the tabletop RPG for DC, and I, and I love the source books because they go through and they classify the heroes. And, you know, here's a picture of this character. Here's their their powers. Here's their stats. You know, here's the, this and that. And I think that that's uh, something I kind of I bring in just that that sort of mentality into the to the look at archetypes and the classification of them. And I'm not I'm not creating or, or inventing. A prescription for superheroes and then laying it over and say make sure all your heroes do this no that's not what it's about it's about looking at the fiction it's about looking at the heroes looking at the stories that have survived the ones that you know rise to the top like i've said before no one no one just creates a character and then boom it's in the public consciousness you know if a character like a superman spider-man uh, iron man or whatever if they're going to seep into the public consciousness and become you know part of the cultural mythology then there is that little formation period there's that little you know um, time where the character is molded a bit by the demand from the audience and that molding tends to 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 take on certain structures you know there's certain patterns to that molding depending on what type of character it is so that's where all these classifications and all these ideas come from uh, just making sure. I'm always, I'm always, uh, always um, paranoid that I'm going to miss a, a super chat or something, but I don't think I did. Good here. All right. Um, no, oh yeah, I got that one. Okay. I did miss one. I did miss one. Let me get this one. Okay. Uh, Rex Blazer. Thought I missed one. Won't always catch these because they do get by me. Uh, for four ninety nine, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Said, do you think it's possible for a protagonist to start as cathartic motivational and then character develop into aspirational? Good question. Uh, very simple, flat answer, no. Absolutely not. Uh, a cathartic motivational character can grow more aspirational, but they can't become the aspirational archetype because the aspirational archetype is that way from the beginning and, and and this is a good segue i'm glad you asked the question this is a good segue for me to go ahead and um and break into that because that is the first distinction well it's sort of one of the first distinctions um it's sort of one of the first distinctions i'll get to it in a second dr y thank you very much said as a military buff it's hard not to hear rpg <laughs> think of the military definition rocket propelled grenade i didn't even think of that i i, I understand yeah okay <laughs> No, I'll think of that every time I say it. So you've got the archetype of the hero. I call it just the monomyth. And that's another word for the hero's journey. You know, Joseph Campbell identified the hero's journey, which is a pretty good identification. And, and other comparative mythologists have come along and, and tweaked the formula a little bit or added to it. But the monomyth, you know, it's this the one basic outline that you can overlay every story you know every human story every story that rises to the to the top of the culture you know um throughout time throughout different geographical locations there are distinctive uh variations of that monomyth though depending on what time period or what culture you're looking at so one of the things i teach in my class is we talk about the american monomyth because that is slightly distinctive and it, and it alters a little bit with time but you know the the american monomyth is going to vary a little bit from, say, the German monomyth. Um, Christopher Vogler, in his uh, Hero's Journey for Writers, I think, book, talks about you know the, the differences between, say, the German monomyth, the Australian monomyth, uh, the American monomyth, and so forth. And the American monomyth has a certain distinctions. I think, I think we're overdue for a more updated definition, but uh, traditionally it's been identified... In a lot of ways, as a Christ figure, not that you know America is the is the you know has the <laughs> the corner on the Christian character market, but I think because if you look at um, a lot of the ideas of selflessness of the American work ethic and whatnot, a lot of these developed from um, you know like the American work ethic can ethic for example can comes from the Puritan work ethic. You know the Pilgrims coming over, and that Pilgrim work ethic comes from Calvinism which is the idea that uh, you need to prove that you're one of the elect. God chose some people to go to heaven, and he chose some people to go to hell, 
And the way that you know if you're chosen to go to heaven is if you're successful and blessed in life. So get your butt working and make sure you prove that you're one of the elect going to heaven, you know, <laughs> and that's silly, right? But that's that's where that came from. And then, you know, it, it, it developed into the idea of social mobility. And, and that, of course, appealed to everybody, not just the pilgrims, but a, a lot of people coming over and settling in this new world. The idea of, hey, we want to be able to not just be born as peasantry or born as aristocracy. We want to be able to, to, you know, be socially mobile, depending on how much work and grit and, and whatnot we put into it and stuff. So that kind of developed. And, and a lot of those ideas did develop, which can be can come straight out of Christianity, you know, whatever flavor of Christianity it comes from. So that, that idea of the Christ figure of a character who rises up selflessly and puts themselves at, at great risk to save others, you know, lays down their life, so to speak, for somebody, you know, on a daily basis or whatever, depending on the hero, and and then fades back into the crowd uh, with, without needing the acclaim. Now, again, you can you can pick this apart already. That's why I was saying we almost need a more updated definition of the American monomyth because Iron Man kind of blows that last part <laughs> out of the water, right? But uh, but yeah. So it's um, the American monomyth is a distinct, a distinct flavor of it. Uh, Eldridge fan, thank you for the super chat there. Said enough power can force a character into the public mind. I'm trying to figure out what exactly you mean by that. You mean like if uh, if a um, all right, let me give you an example, um, a recent example, something I've talked about before. And you mean like something like take a kick character like Isom. Like uh, Ripper versus Isom, it's it's hard to it's hard to find a, a person in the YouTube sphere that doesn't know that name the, that character the name of that character Isom. Oh, I know Isom. That's I mean, Ripper's character. This and that because uh, you know it, just in this little sphere of YouTubers anyway, uh, Young Ripper became a huge channel. I mean, a huge channel, a lot of influence, a, a lot of reach, and he built that up. And, and so that power, maybe that's what you're talking about, can push a created character in front of people. So like Disney can create something and put it in front of a lot of people because they have a large reach. They have the money. They have you know, the marketing. But I'm not just talking about putting a character in front of people. I'm talking about does that character become ingrained in the social consciousness? Is it a character that, that society returns to? and goes to for certain roles and certain, you're not just entertainment, but they rely on this character to, to stand for certain things for the culture. Uh, you know, what is the uh, Disney movie, Red Panda or whatever, you know, that's never, that's, that movie will never resonate with culture. They, Disney will keep pushing it as something, as another product they have, but that no one's ever going to think back, oh, we need that movie again. You know, it was a horrible film. Um, Something like ISOM, the the you know the jury's still out on that. Is that ever going to resonate? I, I don't think it will in that in that respect. But um, but that kind of thing is still you know that it takes time to uh to 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 prove the test of of a character that's created like that. I think I think I've read your uh, comment correctly and understood what you're talking about. So um, we've got the American monomyth, and uh, gentle Tavage, I do see. I think you'd asked it before about Iron Fist. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful frontiersman. Um, I should say, though, before we get any farther in here, so we've got the American monomyth that we're talking about here. And I say American monomyth. I know that a lot of my audience is from, you know, other parts of the world. But when we talk about the superhero, I think we're all talking about some variation of the American monomyth because it's, it's perpetuated through Hollywood. You know, it's um, perpetuated through the American entertainment industry. Yes, there are Indian superheroes. There are, you know, characters and in, in, um, fictional characters that really resonate in certain countries that that are of their own country. So I know that they exist, but you know, for what I'm talking about, obviously I'm American. I'm talking about this, but I think America has a large reach to where it doesn't just apply to America necessarily. It does go out there. So, um, we've got the American monomyth before we get into any of the sub archetypes. And I should mention that when we start talking about specific sub archetypes, like the trickster, like the, the wanderer, like the frontiersman and so forth, uh, they're not hard and fast. Just because a character is labeled the frontiersman, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing that character can ever be. Uh, for example, I was thinking, you know, about characters to put on my um, my thumbnail, and I, and I was thinking about Green Arrow, and I think more often than not, he's he's portrayed as a as a frontiersman, but I was thinking about a lot of ways that he could be portrayed as a war, portrayed as a war hero. Uh, it does depend somewhat on the 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 writer somewhat on the type of story that's being told with the character 
and there are some flavors. It gets kind of complicated where you've got certain um, characters can kind of fade into each other and fade out, whereas others really can't, you know? Um, like, you can't really be a trickster and a paragon. That's just that's just a little too difficult. Uh, but, you know, so, so it goes, you know, there, there are... Um, a lot of these classifications aren't hard and fast rules. Just because we say this character could be considered this doesn't mean that's the only thing they can be considered. And I'll talk about when I go through it how some of the uh, some of them can overlay each other a little bit, depending on stories and whatnot. So just laying the groundwork here. Eldritch fan from four ninety nine, thank you so much. Said, don't forget that Frodo becomes the new Gandalf archetype, pioneered by Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars EU. Oh, oh, EU. Okay. Um, and Iron Man originally had a secret identity. Yeah, so the, so the stories change as well, yeah. Um, you're right, certainly Iron Man back in the day would have uh, been more in line with this. But, you know, as I say, the, the times change, and that's what changes it up a little bit. So good point, good distinction there. Uh, Divinital Kayan, welcome, and thank you so much for the five. said, uh, $5, my hero academia has All Might, who is clearly has his roots in Superman. America has heavily inspired Japan in art. Even to this day, absolutely, absolutely, and I think we're seeing a lot of, uh, for good or for bad, some good ways and some bad ways. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of anime influence or Japan influ Japanese influence and in some American um, franchises as well. So yeah. Okay, so now we need to make our first distinction. We got our American monomyth here. That's great. That's our first level. The first two break. Uh, the first two categories of a hero. And these are broad categories. So all of the sub archetypes we talk about, or you might have heard me talk about, um, can be, you know, that we've got our aspirational heroes and our cathartic motivational heroes. Now, the, the sub archetypes run in, within those. Some sub archetypes don't really work so well as aspirational, um, but they, for the most part, they can be either one or the other. Now, the aspirational hero, because I talk about it so much, let's go ahead and, and clear this up. The aspirational hero is a hero, it's not a hero who's perfect, the aspirational hero can have flaws, they can have, um, they can have real challenges, they can have development, in fact they should have character growth, they should have character development. A lot of times when I talk about the aspirational hero, people think, oh, it's just so flat and two-dimensional, and these are usually people who just don't want to think about an aspirational hero, because they're, you know, on some level they're just too nihilistic in themselves. The fact, though, is that you desperately need aspirational heroes. They're, they're going to be fewer. By necessity, they're going to be fewer aspirational heroes in any one shared universe than there are the cathartic motivationals, and I'll get to those in a second. But the aspirational heroes are characters who are just born good. They're just good. They're just decent. They're just essentially good people from the start. They don't have to suffer any tragedy that makes... They can suffer tragedies, but the tragedies themselves don't make them good. Don't make them, oh, and then I, that's how I realized that I really need to dedicate my life to this, you know, and, and be a better person. No, they just, they have that good heart from the beginning. And they're hard, they're, they're hard for a lot of people to write. I don't think they're hard to write at all, but they're harder for a lot of people to write because your, you know, your average lessons, your average school of writing says, you know, um, take your character and they should have, you know, th th these things should be wrong with them and then they learn this and then, you know, character development. It's easy to write character development in which characters learn how to become better people. That's And that's a great story. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't have an aspirational hero or two or three or whatever in your universe, then characters don't have a standard for which to strive. They, they don't have that standard. So Superman, Captain America, Luke Skywalker, He-Man, all Might, you know, as Divinity Alkayan said, um, Hercules, Disney's Hercules, you know, these are aspirational heroes. They just have that good heart from the beginning. Um, they, 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 there's a sheer goodness about them. They believe that there's always a right thing to do. They believe that it's always worth it to do the right thing. They never, ever question whether or not they should do the right thing. Now, sometimes they might question which is the right thing to do. For example, I mentioned Superman for All Seasons recently, uh, you know, just a few minutes ago. And, and yeah, that story is about Lex Luthor trying to trick Superman into thinking maybe the world's better off without you. Maybe the world's better off without you. You know, and it's young Superman. At no point is Superman ever thinking screw the world the world doesn't need I, I don't even i don't care does it even deserve to be saved i mean no 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 that's like Zack snyder man of steel levels of uh, of ridiculousness so so you know a, a aspirational hero 
can be fooled sometimes. They can be, they can be um, challenged. They can be a little confused as to maybe what the right thing to do is here, but they always know that there's a good right way to do. And in an aspirational hero story, as I said before, you never want to put them in the in the in the situation in which they have to do something bad. They have to cross the line. And it's not that no aspirational hero can ever kill. I mean, Captain America certainly used a gun when he was in the war. Luke Skywalker, you know, in different stories. Of he's, you know, trying to fight and defend innocence. You know, he's going to have to sometimes maybe d deal a killing blow. Uh, it depends on the story. Superman should never, ever kill. Batman should never, ever kill. You know, He-Man should never, well, I wouldn't say it depends on the, the type of story you tell He-Man. Certainly, like, you know, the 80s-style cartoon, He-Man should never, ever kill. If you were telling a little bit more of an adult story like the mini comics or whatever, you know, and there's there's war or whatever, you know, it depends on the story. It depends on the 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 um, the way it's presented. In general, you wouldn't let an aspirational hero kill. But like I said, uh, you know, it depends on the character, depends on the story. The point is that they they are never out to kill. They're always trying to save the innocent. They're always trying to even save the criminals from themselves, if that's at all possible. So, you know, playing into Batman, you know, not killing him. And some people were like, okay, but seriously, though, he's got to kill the Joker, right? I mean, the Joker's like, he's just, it makes sense for him to kill the Joker, though, because the Joker's really bad. No, if you if you make any concession there, if you start to make any concession, then you're saying, basically what you're saying is, we should always do the right thing unless this Here's the line in which it's okay for us not to do the right. Or here's the line in which the wrong thing is actually the right thing to do. You know, once you make that concession, it's just a matter of time before that line gets closer and closer and closer and closer to you until you don't have to really do much work on yourself at all as a human being. Because, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's all relevant. It's all, you know, it, it, that's just, that's... That's what that's the slope that that happens. And the aspirational heroes are there to show us that, no, there's a standard. The standard exists. The standard is fixed. It's not realistic that we're going to meet that standard, but we need to keep sights on that standard. And that's what the aspirational heroes are for. There is a one of the sub archetypes is the Paragon and the Paragon can only ever be aspirational. So a lot of the characters I just mentioned are the, the Paragons, Superman, Captain America, Luke Skywalker. These are Paragons, meaning that in their universe, they serve as like they're on the Wheaties box of their universe. They are inspirational to all who know them. You know, they're but you can have a character like Naruto, for example, who's aspirational, 100 percent aspirational. He he never, ever uh entertains the idea of doing the wrong thing you know he's got his ninja way there's all he wants to do everything right he wants to but he's also a trickster and a numbskull <laughs> and he's given to emotional outbursts and whatever and, and he fails a lot and he screws up a lot you know and he's um but he never questions whether or not there's a right thing to do and whether or not he should do the right thing and he inspires a lot of people by his uh his determination in that but he's not a paragon right so all paragons are aspirational, but not necessarily all aspirational heroes are paragons. That's just a, a little distinction there. All right, so we've covered the aspirational hero. We've, we're still just dealing with our two major distinctions of heroes. So if you're losing me a little bit, or um, you know, we're, or if I'm losing you a little bit, excuse me, we're, we're talking about the American monomyth, which for the most part is the American distinction of the superhero. And we're just dividing it into two main categories. We're going to look at more more uh, finer categories in a second. But we're just looking at two main categories, the the uh, aspirational hero, which we just covered. And if you have questions, we can talk about that more. And in a second, we're going to look at the cathartic motivational, which is the second big major category of heroes. But first, I've got a super chat here from Studio Super. Thank you so much. He said, the aspirational hero can be hard for a lot of people to write because they can overcomplicate things when the nature of the aspirational hero is simple. They know what they have to do. The challenge is how to do it. Exactly. Exactly. And I've talked about this uh, somewhat recently before, and you, you put that beautifully there. Uh, you know, a good example of that is if you want to challenge Superman, be like, oh, he's so overpowered. It's so not even interesting. What do you mean it's not interesting? Uh, it, it might be crazy hard to to hurt Superman, but you know what? You, you, you can you can challenge him in that he needs to save all of these people. Uh you know, there's there was that great um, 
I, I don't love the Nolan Batman movies, but there are some really great scenes in them. Um, and that scene in Dark Knight at the end with the two boats, the two ferries, you know, and the and the uh, the the bomb on both of them, and, and the Joker trying to show Batman that you know, see, everybody would just kill. See, look, they're they're gonna kill. And it's like one is the convicts and one is the school children. And uh, you know, look, even you should know that we need to kill the convicts one, right? You know, stop trying to pretend that there's a good and right thing to do. You know, we we're all just you know, it's all just anarchy or whatever. And uh, and the convicts themselves, you know, refuse to hit the button to throw up the to throw to to blow up the the ferries for the kids. They throw it out the window. And it was the convicts themselves who made that choice. It wasn't the guards. It was the convicts. A beautiful scene, really. For all the problems I have with Nolan's films, some of those scenes are just wow. That was really great. And the Joker has to learn that lesson, right? You know, Batman's like you. You need to believe in people more. Uh, you know, so so. They a lot of people just shouldn't be writing aspirational heroes. When when they they're to complain about it's too hard to write them or you know oh they're too flat or whatever that's because you don't understand them. You need to grow more as a writer. Um, so yeah, I agree. Andre Hernandez says, "Have you ever wondered how people complain when Superman and Batman kill, but don't when Captain America and Iron Man do kill?" Oh, that's was what I was. That's because that's what I was like. Was <laughs> that's like what I was just saying, and that it's not a hard and fast rule that every aspirational hero can never kill. Now, Captain America, I don't think it's great to have him killing as a member of the Avengers, you know, although I'm no expert on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there are um, instances in which they are at war and such like that. But uh, Captain America has killed plenty as a soldier, you know, back in his day. But that's not what the aspirational heroes set out to do. If there's any way at all to avoid killing, they're going to do that. You know, like Wonder Woman, the great quote, I've made the meme and I showed it before, where uh, I think Hippolyta is teaching Wonder Woman. I think it came from one of the Sensation Comics featuring Wonder Woman stories in which Hippolyta, her mother, taught her, we never kill if we can wound, and we don't wound if we can subdue, and we don't subdue if we can talk and communicate and reach a... And she says, basically, you never raise your hand unless you first extended it, you know, in friendship. Because Wonder Woman's a great example. She's an Amazon. She's a warrior. Uh... In certain contexts on the battlefield or whatever, you know, uh, fighting minotaurs or whatever, you know, uh, if it comes down to it and there needs to be killing blows dealt, they can be dealt. But you never raise your hand at all in any way unless you first extend it, you know, first try to find some way around it. Um, definitely. All right. So let's move on now to the second major example of uh, of of hero division. So we talked about the aspirational hero. Now let's talk about the cathartic motivational. And I say the cathartic motivational, that this is a very careful term. I want to teach this in my classes. Students like to just kind of shorthand it and say, yeah, the cathartic hero, the cathartic hero. It's like, no, no, no. You can't just say cathartic hero because that's a different kind of character in general. Cathartic hero, you might as well be talking about Hamlet, you know, or a tragic hero or something like that. And those characters exist, and they serve their purpose, but they're not heroes. You, know, you can call by them hero in terms of a, being a protagonist, but not a hero in terms of a monomyth. Because the, the cathartic hero just exhibits a lot of moral failings and shows us, don't do that. Don't do what that guy did, you know? So like Hamlet, for example, uh, he's told very clearly at the beginning of the play, his, the ghost of his dead father, for crying out loud, comes to him and says, I was murdered. You need to avenge me. So he knows what he has to do. It's good for to his father's soul. It's also good for the kingdom. He's the prince of the kingdom. If he if he needs you know if the kingdom's to be saved, he needs to go avenge his father's death. But he spends the whole freaking play going, should I really though? I I mean really, I mean, me should I be the one to do that? Let me let me just do this little test. All right, let me do this test. All right, now let me try this one more test. And the whole time he's doing this, the whole time he's avoiding doing what he has to do, people around him are just dying left and right. Until the end of the play, the whole stage is just littered with corpses, and it finally including his own and the dead uncle that he you know, should have killed to begin with. And that's, you know, don't do that, right? So there's a catharsis that, uh, that, that uh, that's part of the cathartic motivational. So there is a cathartic aspect to cathartic motivational heroes. They should show us some moral failings that we need to know, hey, we shouldn't do that. But the motivational is incredibly important because the motivational tells us it shows us in the same character. It shows us the moral failing 
and then it shows them get up, dust themselves off, and be better. So Spider-Man is a great example. He's the example I always give. He's my go-to example, but I'll give some others. But he's the one who gets these powers, and then he, what does he do with them? Immediately, he wants to make money, whether it's to, you know, in a more altruistic telling of it, you know, help his Aunt May. Uh, but then a lot of tellings of it, he just wants to wants to finally, you know, take care of himself, for crying out loud. He's been poor for so long. Get a good car. Get get some ladies or whatever. And so he uses those powers for his own uh, his own agenda there, his own good. And then that, that backfires on him, right? And the best tellings of the story, it's it's where he lets the thug go who would eventually kill Uncle Ben. And he realizes, uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. I, I made some bad choices here. But that's not who I am. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be better. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to be better. And and that's what we love about cathartic motivational heroes so much, because they show us that hey, it's okay when we screw up. When we screw up, we don't have to say, well, pff, might as well just be a villain or an antihero. I screwed up the whole hero thing. No, it shows us that yeah, we are gonna screw up, but we can try again and we can get better and we can improve. And so that's why cathartic motivational heroes are so important. And they, they tend to run rampant. They're, they're far more ubiquitous out there than aspirational heroes, as it should be. But even cathartic motivational heroes don't work within their universe unless they have an aspirational standard to look up to. Uh, whether it's Spider-Man looking up to Captain America or all of the characters, all of the Jedi, you know, in... Uh, in the Star Wars EU, looking up to Luke and the and the examples that he set and so forth, that's the you know that they need that standard to strive toward. Uh, you mentioned My Hero Academia. Yeah, I mean, even the other not not even just the student heroes, but the other professional heroes, even what's his name, um, the number two hero, uh, the Heat, who becomes the number one hero. The um, oh shoot, Todoroki's father. I can't think of his name right now. But uh, even he, you know, when he when All Might loses his powers and he becomes kind of the number one ranked hero, he, he goes to All Might like, how do you do this? How do we do this? And there's this wonderful episode where he's learning that he truly has to give his all, and lay it on the line to save people, you know. So the two are, are interrelated. They need each other. Uh, Studio Super, thank you for the 999, says, With Samurai Jack, I love the show. Not only is Jack an aspirational hero that follows the hero's journey from episode one, but the whole show, I feel, is a great example of mythological storytelling. I really enjoyed that con that cartoon. I can't say I've watched every episode, but I really enjoyed it when it was on Cartoon Network back in the day, I think. Um, I'd like to watch it some more. Yeah, uh, great premise, too. Wonderful premise, because it's, you know, this samurai of, you know, with, with a code, you know, samurais have a code. That's a great premise. I'm no expert on Japanese lore or samurais in general, but I just did just start playing the video game Ghost of Tsushima. And wow, what an awesome setting. What, you know, I had the code to honor, you know, and we're not going to assassinate from the shadows. We're going to, you know, um, honor our code and stuff. So yeah, it's a great, uh, great field to play in with the aspirational hero. Uh, Robo Slomo, good to see you there. Haven't seen you in a while. Thanks for popping by. Uh, Another super chat here from Michael Scambati said, uh, who would be your Mount Rushmore of DC villains? Oh, that's hard. Uh, let me take a minute or two to answer you there for the super chat. I appreciate it. Um, gosh, DC. I mean, you'd have to put the Joker. You'd have to put Lex Luthor. I'm thinking about the most seminal uh, villains from some of the main heroes. Because the villains aren't interesting to me unless they're pitted against a hero. You know, unless they're, they're there to challenge that hero. So if we're looking at the DC universe in general, then we'd have to pick one for Wonder Woman. And you, you could say Ares. On the other hand, I think you could pick um, Cheetah. I'd probably go with Cheetah because her story is in some ways a nice dark mirror to, to Diana's. So I'd probably say Cheetah there. I'm just off the top of my head. And I would probably say maybe Captain Cold. I think Captain Cold. Not so much for his power, but for his attitude in, in his, um, you know, I think he, he references the Flash, and Flash is a great trickster of the DC Universe really well. Yeah, that's just a very short answer. I mean, maybe I'd change that if I had more time to think about it, but thanks for the chat there. Um, Dr. Wise said, thank you for explaining Hamlet to me. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> yeah, there's the cliff notes, guys. Now you can go write your book reports. <laughs> uh Brady Burleson, thank you so much, there says, is there a way to deconstruct the concept of deconstruction itself or subvert subversion in a way that would be good? 
uh, okay, we're getting into some 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 word games there, but let me make sure I try and stay on task for you. Yes, you can subvert subversion, right? So you can have a um a type of story in which you know you know, and I'm gonna spoil the snot out of this movie, and it's a pretty good movie. So if you haven't seen it, maybe you want to mute for a second. But Stranger Than Fiction, really great film. It's this film that a lot of people missed. Will Ferrell of all people. Uh, start in this movie but it's not a Will Ferrell type comedy by any means um, Dustin Hoffman uh, Emma Emma Thompson yeah it's it's a great movie about this woman who is writing these books and all of her books end in a certain way where her protagonist dies and that's and she's a great literary author she's well thought of and there's this guy Will Ferrell's character going down the street one day and he starts hearing this internal monologue and he's like Hello, what, what, what is that? You know, and he is the quintessential type character. He ends up being the character of a book that she's writing. Yet he's also in the real world next to her. It's a really great meta story. It's wonderful, and uh, he tries to get help from this literary professor, Dustin Hoffman's character, who really studied this woman, and they just, they figure out what's going on, and she has to decide. Do I write? Because whatever she's writing in her manuscript is happening to this guy, this guy in real life. And for her to be true to her art and true to her way of writing, this guy needs to die. And he's like, well, I don't want to die. Don't kill me. <laughs> no. And uh, in the end, and again, I'm going to spoil it for you, but it's so good. In the end, she lets him live. And uh, that's the altruistic thing to do, right? Don't kill somebody. <laughs> but at the same time, the literary professor is like, you, you dropped the ball. You're, 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 you just drop the notch of, of your art, you know, and uh, I don't know, it's really fascinating. But that but that is a way that it kind of subverts the subversion, because watching the movie, everybody that I've known who watched that movie along going through it, you're like, yeah, he's going to die. He's got to I mean, he's got to die. He's got to die. This is horrible. And then when it uh, so the day and it's actually very artistic, I think, and poetic, the way he survives too. his watch ends up saving him. And his watch was the thing that he was a slave to and whatnot, you know, time and, and organization and stuff like that. So it's it's a great film. That's an example of how, yeah, you can subvert the subverted expectation. Um, yeah. Thanks for the interesting twist on it there. We will get back to the cathartic motivation in a second, but I just don't like to miss these super chats when they come in because it is a live stream. Nathaniel Zalosball says, uh, different flavors, huh? First thing that came to mind was a Vash. Uh, 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 yeah, Vash, Vash, the Stampede from Trigon. He's an aspirational hero, but he's also uh, a trickster and a wanderer. Yeah, Vash the Stampede is such a freaking awesome character. Uh, I still haven't watched the, the other... I hear it's not very good. I think it's like a prequel series that they did somewhat recently. But, man, that original series was just so perfection. Oh, man, great aspirational hero. And you're right. He wasn't Paragon. In fact, people thought he was a, a serial killer or, you know, the Wild West villain or whatever. But he wasn't. He was a he was a hero. He's a great, great character. Really glad you brought that up. Wonderful. Wonderful one. Uh, okay, so the cathartic motivational. Let me... Hopefully I've, I've explained it. I feel like I haven't spent as much time on that as I have the aspirational, but at the same time, we just know the cathartic motivational. It's any hero that we can follow that messes up, but that picks themselves up and, and tries again and tries to be better. Uh, Iron Man is a great aspirational hero. I mean, excuse me, he's a great cathartic motivational hero. You know, he's... um, And this is an aspect, too, that when we're talking about... And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get... This refresher course can go a lot longer, so I'm not going to cover all the archetypes just in my little stream tonight. Maybe I'll do a part two next week if you guys want more of this. But um, there are two elements to a hero's origin. Every superhero, every origin story, there's two aspects to it. There's the call to adventure and the empowerment. And these can happen in, in any order. Sometimes they can happen at once. Sometimes one can happen before the other. But there's a call to adventure and an empowerment. And a lot of cathartic motivational heroes receive their empowerment before their call to adventure because their empowerment is, is what they take and misuse, like Spider-Man misusing his powers at first. Or Iron Man, you know, growing up with all of that wealth and all of that knowledge. I mean, he's empowered long before he even builds the suit. He's empowered. But that situation he's stuck in, you know, in that cave is is makes is is that call to adventure and uh and they have to respond to the call to adventure in a more heroic way than they responded to their empowerment 
Uh, again, they can happen in different orders or whatever, but uh, quite often cathartic motivational heroes um, receive their, their empowerment beforehand. Uh, there, there are also qualifiers. This is probably for another stream, but there are also qualifiers on the natures of that empowerment in Call to Adventure. It can be happened by destiny, it can happen by chance, or it can happen by your own screw-up. You know, and, and the, you can put those qualifiers on each of them. And obviously, a, a aspirational hero has more of a destiny-driven um, empowerment. Superman didn't ask to be sent to Earth as a Kryptonian, you know, but he was, and it was just kind of that destiny-driven, you know, and that became his empowerment. Uh, you know, so those are qualifiers. We'll talk about that more in depth later. But I think we've covered at least our two main main uh, categories of heroes, the aspirational and cathartic motivational. So hopefully this is going to make people better understand what I mean when I say that, you know, Saitama is not an aspirational archetype. You might aspire to be like him. You might things, find things that you admire in him in One Punch Man. But he himself is just looking for a challenge. And he's like, oh, do I have to go fight that villain who's putting those people's lives in peril right now? I don't know. It's not even going to be a challenge for me. Do I even want to do this right now? That is not aspirational. <laughs> not aspirational at all. No, he's a good guy. He might eventually decide to do it or whatever. But aspirational hero would never even think twice, would be there. Deku would be there, giving it his all, you know. So uh, so that's what I mean when I say the aspirational hero. Um, oh, this nice Trigon the manga is getting an omnibus collection. That is good to know. I definitely am going to pick that up because uh, I have not read the manga. But uh, but dang, that, that old anime show was awesome. I uh, got another super chat here before I miss it. Oh, come on. Highlight it. Sean says... Keep up, StreamYard. Sean says, if the Paragon is moral, does that mean that they must be sexually moral as well? Um, depending on the rules of their universe, right? This is one of the big problems with Superman Returns. Honestly, it's one of the problems with Superman 2, to be honest. Him taking Lois Lane up to the fortress and then, you know, maybe you could, you could, you know, if, if you're morally lax in a certain way, you're like, well, it's no big deal, you know, whatever. They're in a relationship or whatever. But Superman Returns had the idea that you don't you don't sleep with her and then just leave her without saying goodbye. <laughs> you know, and then coming back and like, Well, but I didn't know that uh, you were pregnant. Well, how could you if you didn't stick around long enough to find out, you know? So um so yeah, certain certain uh every aspect of their life, whether it's their sexual, you know, behaviors or whatever, has to be moral within the rules and context of that universe. Um, you know, to say what is sexually moral, well, that's going to depend on the person you're asking. But now when we're talking about fictional universes, that's even more complex, because what is it to be sexually moral in the Star Wars universe? Uh, you know, to my knowledge, there's no, um, you know, religions that say you shouldn't have premarital sex in the Star Wars universe, at least not, you know, galaxy wide. So uh, so it depends on the universe and the rules of the universe. But it's a good question. And, and it really the answer is that every aspect of their life uh, should be striving to be moral. Isaiah Smith, thank you for the super chat. Twenty dollars, man! Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's super chats, and I know a lot of you, um, a lot of you unsung heroes, go uh, maybe unpraised because you guys get, give like one nine nine, four nine nine, one nine nine, four nine, and by the end of the night, you've given quite a bit. So I do appreciate all of the super chatters by all means, but you got to call out somebody who drops twenty on you. So I really appreciate this. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate that. He said everyone gets hung up on Anakin, but it was Luke who brought balance to the Force. Haven't even finished reading your super chat, but I gotta give you some applause right there. I do agree so far. Luke surrendered to the light and subdued the dark, not through fighting, but by showing Anakin the power and love and the folly of prophecies. I 100% agree, and and uh, and a lot of people take me to task and just can't stand that I'm saying this, but I do agree. Luke ended up being the chosen one. Now, Anakin was the prophecy was true, and that through Anakin, balance would come to the Force, but it was ultimately through his son. And it also shows that prophecies can be, you know, you have to reject or accept the call, so to speak. And in a, in a lot, in a really beautiful, poetic way, the Star Wars, you know, trilogy there is about the redemption of Anakin. Sure, we can we can look at it like that. But Luke is the hero. Luke is the one who says no to the darkness and yes to the light. Luke is the one who says yes to the light, even when it means saying no to his mentors saying no to Obi-Wan or Yoda. No, my friends need to be saved. No, my father can be saved. You don't understand. I'm not just going to kill him. He can be saved, you know. Uh, 
Luke is the, the quintessential aspirational hero in that manner. Just great. And, uh, and yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. Thanks for uh, putting it in that uh, succinct manner. Um, Studio Super, thank you so much. Again, said uh, this land is made of love and peace. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Studio. I said Studio Super. I'm sorry. I always see, and your your icon is black and white, just like Studio Supers as well. Studio 96 Films, you are a very different person and deserve your own recognition. <laughs> thank you. Land is made of love and peace. Uh, love and peace. Love. Yeah, Trigon. Took me a second to we're like, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, Trigon. Love and peace. <laughs> Uh, now, Studio Super, thank you for the 999. Again, thank you guys who just uh, keep coming at it with these chats. I really do it. We do appreciate it. Sound Engraver and I both appreciate it. I mean, you're you're supporting my channel and me, which I totally uh, appreciate. But in some ways, you're you know, Sound Engraver is my wife, so these super chats go to both of us, and uh, and they help. You know, they they help me to be able to justify spending more time on my channel because my channel is my hobby. You know, it's not a business. I'm not out here trying to, you know, um, make sure I play into the algorithms and cover all the hot button issues, you know, and, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I'm here to be who I am and, and to maintain integrity, but it's also just that, that hobby there. And uh, the, the amount of money I make on it in any given month kind of determines how much more time I can spend on it uh, or how much more time I need to shift into spending on, you know, more money making uh, things that to earn our living. Summers, for example, because I, I teach as an adjunct professor. And I don't always get classes to teach on the summers. Now I do other things, you know, paper tutoring, stuff like that. But summers um, tend to be a lesser, you know, a bit of a drier uh, period for me. And I would love to spend more time on YouTube and let that fill the gap. But it depends on how well the videos do, how much well the subscribers, my subscribers have grown. I never really, I know we'll get to your chat in a second. I just, I'm just brr, tangent, <laughs> but I will uh, get to the, um, uh, I never really pay attention to my subscriber count because it's a number and I just don't follow numbers, but, uh, but I am zeroing in on, on 17,000. I'm, I'm at like uh 16, 30 something. Uh, Ethan and Skyver had EFAPed a couple of my videos, which I think uh, helped bring, bring some attention, which I appreciate. But, uh, but yeah. So anyway, all that to say, very much appreciated. <laughs> you say, 999, uh, in regards to my question last stream between Frontiersmen and Tricksters, is it possible for a sub-archetype to slip through into another one if a writer isn't careful? Which are more prone to do that? Yes, yes. And this is a probably, and I'll, I'll finish reading my super chats. Don't worry, I'm not going to just end the stream. But I think this is a good way to kind of wrap up at least thus far what I'm talking about with archetypes tonight. We'll, we'll continue our refresher course next week if you guys want to or another day this week if you guys want to because there's a lot more to talk about. So far, we've just covered the main two distinctions there. But yeah, when you're talking about sub archetypes, some of them do slip into one another. So as you were saying, you know, the trickster and frontiersman can slip into one another a little bit here and there. Um, some other ones, the, the paragon and heroine archetype uh, quite often cross paths. They don't have to. But, you know, like a Wonder Woman type approach to the heroine that bridges the boundaries uh, is, is very easily seen as a paragon, whereas a Black Widow confronts that that uh, that aspect in a different way, which makes her certainly not a paragon um, or aspirational even. But uh, but yeah, so they can um, they can slip in. And now it's not always wrong. You say can sometimes writers kind of slip. Now, I would say don't do it within the same story. Okay, within the same episode, the same book, or the same story, or whatever you'd like to, you'd want to maintain, or your character in the story will work best if you maintain the rules of that one archetype. But you know, like comic books, for example, you know this issue or this run of issues, Green Lantern can be seen more, or Green Arrow can be seen more of as a frontiersman. Um, you know, they, they can kind of shift focus, and he can be uh, operating as a war hero more in another one, and so forth, because the war hero protects boundaries and going out there and protecting the uh, the undertrodden. You know. Uh, the downtrodden from, you know, upper classes, just uh, corruption and so forth. So, yeah, um, that can be the case. And there are some archetypes that, that slip into that. We'll talk about that more and cover the extent of that when we talk about more archetypes. Um, and these archetypes, Gentle Savage, I just see this one here. Um, does Bane fit the elemental villain archetype? There, there is, yeah, there is a certain set of archetypes that apply to villains, which aren't exactly the same as the heroes. There's some, you know, you can see trickster villains and so forth and whatnot. Um, Bane is elemental villain. I'd have to think about that because I know Bane is villain. I have to really go back and read my Chuck Dixon and Graham Nolan Bane stuff to really get the 100%, make sure I'm not missing anything. 
because he was raised like that, you know, and you you might think, well, how would he have been if he wasn't like that? At the same time, we don't really get any picture of Bane, uh, you know, nature versus nurture. I don't know. Let me think on that. You kind of caught me right off the, the bat, but good question. Uh, my dear sound engraver says yes both prop and i are teachers yes my dear sound engraver is a music teacher teaches different instruments and voice and all kinds of things um and do check out her stream i think it's probably set up already for tomorrow she'll be streaming tomorrow with that that does um that does wrap me up here to my just about to my hour mark or a little bit over technically so i'm gonna wrap things up here in a second but uh Oh, Nathaniel Elizabeth, is he talking about Bane or Darth Bane? I think he was talking about Bane, not Darth Bane from um, from Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek, Star Wars. Oh, you can tell I'm tired. Yeah. By the end of an hour on these streams, I'm uh, pretty much pretty much out of the energy. It's that uh, being such an introvert all the time. Such an introvert. When you're an introvert, when you're as introverted as I am, you see the world going through the world on a daily basis is like navigating a world full of vampires. They're just trying to suck, you know, your life force, you know. <laughs> hey, come here, come here, come here. I want to talk to you about something. And you're like, eh. like I've had to uh and we're wrapping up here, but I've had to for example just decide I'm not doing any more guest spots on any other uh YouTube channels. I'm I'm immensely honored that any other YouTube channel would would want me to come do a guest spot on there. I very much am, absolutely. And I've enjoyed the ones I've done. 100% the last one I did with on Matt Wilkins' channel. Matt Wilkins is a great guy. But the thought of making an appointment where I have to be somewhere on so-and-so's channel at a certain time and I have to be on, and then you're kind of at their mercy for how long they're going to run the stream, and, oh, just pass. Just uh, let me be my introverted hermit <laughs> self. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I am I am uh, nice and wiped out by now. But thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I did very much appreciate the stream. And we're not done. I'm giving you this little refresher course. I will continue. All we've done so far is acknowledge the American version of the monomyth and talk about the very first two distinctions. Paid a little bit of lip service to the sub-archetypes, and we'll talk more about them. Paid a little lip service to the, the aspects of the hero's origin, you know, the call to adventure and the empowerment and the qualifiers that exist within that. Uh, there are a lot of other aspects to talk about, about archetypes. So uh, if you guys like this, if you want more, you know, uh, I will cut out uh, some portions of this as their own videos, and we'll see how they perform as well. And we can certainly do these more, and we can certainly cover more and, uh, and uh, continue the, the coverage of the topic. Um, Rounding us out here, Super Studio Super says, is there an archetype that resurrects resurrects boundaries? Say a society moves on into a future with few and less boundaries, and a hero seeks to reintroduce forgotten boundaries for a new gen. Uh, now, without talking to you a lot more in depth, knowing exactly the scenarios you're talking about, it sounds like you're talking about the detective, because the detective restores boundaries. The detective stories, as I've said, they're very popular uh, in times when there's upheaval in society and the detectives have to come back in and say, okay, but there are certain rules that can't be crossed. You know, <laughs> a murder's taking place. We don't just let that go because things are different now. We need to find the perpetrator. We need to, you know, so well, I'll say more about that later. But yeah, the, the detective does restore boundaries, which is kind of like what you're saying, resurrect boundaries. So yeah, that's um, that might be what you're thinking about. All right, guys. Well, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Again, I hope you, those of you who observe Palm Sunday, have a wonderful Palm Sunday tomorrow and uh, just a restful weekend period. Uh, enjoy the spring weather and I will be back with more. I'll cut out some of these videos. Uh, I'm going to be working on an analysis soon um, of Ghost of Matacumbe Key. I wanted to wait until I'd read the Chinoo and Alien Alamo, which I've done now. So Compass Comics, you know, kind of covering this whole universe. I've done that, kind of letting it percolate in my mind. Then I'll get back to trying to finish up uh, the She Omnibus, which I'll be working on uh, analysis for that too. So those are coming, as well as cutouts from this stream and uh, more live streams later. Thank you guys for watching. Appreciate everything you guys uh, do to support the channel. And until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the true blue hero stories you love.